Today, we are going to talk about part of speech tagging, which is an extremely important topic in uh, statistical natural language processing or let us say whole of natural language processing. And uh, the fact that part of speech tagging is an important component of natural language processing is well recognized, but uh, the computational task of part of speech tagging gained uh, visibility and respectability, let us say, in uh, recent times in last 10 to 15 years, but it is very, very well uh, understood that a good part of speech tagger is a crucial component of any natural language processing task. Before beginning any processing, any sophisticated processing on text, it is important to know the categories of the words that form the text. So, this is the uh, discussion of today. We are going to uh, describe the part of speech tagging problem, the statistical approach to doing this, because it is well recognized again that uh, part of speech tagging is best done by machine learning methods from the annotated corpora. Human created rules for part of speech tagging do a good job no doubt, but they are uh, brittle subject to human error and uh, may miss out uh, phenomena. But on the other hand, if we have uh, data or text which is already marked with part of speech tags and we run a machine learning algorithm on this, then it is possible to create a statistical system which uh, does a very good job of part of speech tag. So, here is uh, the definition of the problem. Part of speech tagging is a process that attaches each word in a sentence with a suitable tag from a given set of tags. The set of tags is called the tag set. There are many standard tag sets. Uh, pen tree bank for English is pr probably the most visible and famous set of tags for uh, categorizing the words of English language. Now, here are some examples of part of speech tags. N n is noun, uh, for example, dog is N n. We had discussed this in the last class, but let me repeat uh, this point once again, just to clarify the notion of tags and how they are placed with the words. So, one of the options to place the category information is by placing an underscore and then placing N n. But uh, you could also uh, conceive of this being an XML file where each word is placed within XML mark, which also specifies what the tag of the word is. Anyway, those are representations. However, we find that uh, each word needs a categorization. In the text, we do not leave out any word. Similarly, V m, which is a very important tag, namely the main verb of the sentence. For example, John runs, here run is the word and it has the category V m, main verb with an underscore before. V ox is the auxiliary verb. So, is, am, are, these are auxiliary verbs, they also are tagged in the text. So, is underscore V ox is the tag shown here. J j is the adjective tag and I remark that adjective is sometimes pronounced with d very similar to the j sound. So, red is an adjective as in red ball. So, red underscore j j would be the tag for the word red. P r p is also an important tag pronoun. So, u is a pronoun. So, u underscore p r p is the tagged word. N n p is the tag for proper noun, John underscore N n p shows the tagging for John as in the sentence John runs. So, N n p is the tag for John and so on. So, this way a piece of text is completely tagged for every word in it. Proceeding further, now pause tag ambiguity is very common in text. I take here a sentence, 
which was mentioned in the last class too. In English, I could have a sentence, I bank on the bank on the river bank for my transactions. So, I bank on the bank on the river bank for my transactions. The lower suffixes uh, indicate the occurrence of the word bank. So, bank 1 here is the first occurrence of bank, bank 2 here is the second occurrence and bank 3 here is the third occurrence. Bank 1 is verb because I bank on the bank on the river bank for my transactions. Here this bank means depend. So, I depend on the bank on the river bank for my transactions. So, bank 1 is verb, the other two banks are noun. Uh, I bank on the bank. So, this is the actual bank where uh, financial transaction take is taking place and this third bank is nothing but the river bank. Uh, in Hindi, uh, the word khana can be a noun or a verb. So, when it is a noun, it means food, when it is verb, it means to eat. So, khana again has a uh, pause tag ambiguity. Now, I take uh, two examples here, which were mentioned towards the end of the last class, but let us uh, describe this in little more detail just to bring out the ambiguity issue in pause tagging. Ram achha gata hai. So, hai is auxiliary verb, it is an auxiliary verb. So, it has the tag v ox. The meaning of the sentence is Ram sings well. Now, Ram achha gata hai. Here, this achha is a qualifier for the verb and therefore, this is an adverb. So, Ram achha gata hai, achha is an adverb. Ram achha ladka hai. So, see that both the sentences look very similar except for these two words gata and ladka. Here we say that hai is not an auxiliary verb because it is not a helping verb. Okay? Uh, an auxiliary verb requires a, a main verb which it is helping. In the previous sentence gata was the main verb and hai is the auxiliary verb, it is the helping verb for gata. Uh, the auxiliary verb carries the a tense number and person information. Ram achha gata hai, hai here indicates that the person is third person singular number and the tense is present tense. Ram achha gata hai, Ram sings well, present tense, singular number, third person. All this information is carried on hai. Now, Ram achha ladka hai, here uh, hai uh, is not preceded by a main verb, we do not call it an auxiliary verb, it is called a copula verb. Okay? It is a copula verb and the symbol for this in part of speech tagging is V cop. So, Ram achha ladka hai indicates uh, the goodness of Ram, Ram is a good boy. Now, here achha qualifies ladka which is a noun, therefore, achha is an adjective in the previous sentence, achha was an adverb because achha was qualifying the verb. So, the whole point of this discussion is that these sentences are very similar except for these two words gata and larka, but the word achha has different pause tags depending on what it qualifies. In the first case, it is adverb, second case, it is an adjective. Similarly, hai, hai preceded by verb, which is helping the main verb is the auxiliary verb and hai here is the copula verb. Now, we uh, can understand that words can have multiple pause tags and it is important to disambiguate them. It is important to place the correct tag depending on the sentential, sentential context in which it appears. Now, uh, if you look at these two sentences, you may be tempted to come up with this kind of rule that when uh, a word which can be both adverb and adjective, for example, achha here, if it is followed by a verb, gata, this then is an adverb 
if it is followed by a noun, then it is an adjective. So, this is ok, because uh, the principle that is operating in your mind is that acha is qualifying a verb, therefore it is adverb here, acha is qualifying a noun, therefore it is an adjective here. But the problem comes when we insist that the following word is the clue for disambiguation. Okay. So, part of speech tagging of course, is the first level task, syntax, semantics all these have not been done. We have just started processing the text. So, we cannot assume any syntactical clue or semantic clue. We cannot assume parsing is done or the semantic role has been obtained. So, we necessarily have to depend on the clues from nearby area. So, nobody refutes that, nobody argues with that. It is definitely the case that we have to disambiguate based on clues available in the near vicinity. The most powerful clue comes from the suffixes, the morphological features on the word itself. So, in this case we find acha is the word and the in both cases the word forms the same. Therefore, uh, there is no morphological clue. Actually, there should be an A here. Achha. So, Ram Achha Larka hai, and there should be an A here. And uh, if we say that it is uh, followed by a verb, it is adverb, followed by a noun, it is adjective. Now, the problem is that it is possible to have some amount of text between Achha and Gata, Achha and Larka. So, Ram To acha hi gata hai for example ram to acha hi gata hai so you have the particle hi between acha and gata ram to acha hi larka hai this is again possible and therefore you can have some amount of text between acha and larka sometimes uh, what can happen is that because of movement because of topicalization focus etc words can move ram larka acha hai you can say Ram Larka Acha hai. Ha Ram Gata to Acha hi hai. So, now you can see here Acha has gone after Gata, Acha here too has gone after Larka. So, let me write this to clarify what I am saying. Ram Acha Gata hai because of topicalization, which means emphasis, one could have the situation Ram Gata to Acha hai. Ram Gata to Acha hai par and you can have some other piece of text coming after it. So, here also you can see that Acha is an adverb, Acha is an adverb, it's, it is still qualifying Gata, but uh, if you if we say that the rule is adverb should be followed by a verb, that rule will fail in this case. Okay? So, the rule will work in most cases. Ram acha gata hai, acha is adverb, this is fine. But in this case, because of the movement of the word, even though acha is adverb, this rule is not applicable because gata is coming before acha. Ram gata to acha hai. You could also have Ram gata to acha hi hai, making it little more complex. Now, can the same thing happen for adjective? So, we had the sentence Ram acha larka hai. Again, because of word movement, this rule of noun following an adjective will not work here. Ram, you can say Ram Larka to Acha hai, Ram Larka to Acha hai per and another piece of text, okay, identical situation. So, Larka has moved and because of this movement, the fact that acha is qualifying a noun and therefore, it is an adjective, that rule will not work. So, uh, I suppose uh, you have understood that uh, 
this is the point. We have to use simple rules for part of speech tagging, na namely the word clues from the immediate vicinity of the word, but they are fallible rules, they are brittle rules because there can be many natural language phenomena which work against these rules. Proceeding further, the process of part of speech tagging is list all possible tag for each word in the sentence, choose the best suitable tag sequence. So, this is the process for each word we list all possible tags for each word in the sentence and we choose the best suitable tag sequence. Here is an example to illustrate this point. People jump high. It is a fictitious sentence. Let us not worry about the meaning of this sentence as to what it could possibly indicate. Maybe it is a sentence from a discourse in a, in a context. So, people jump high. People can be both noun and verb. Jump can be noun and verb. High can be noun, verb, adjective. So, if you are not convinced, we can take examples to see how people jump and high can have these multiple tags. This I believe needs a bit of explanation. So, we take people, people can be noun or verb. How can it be noun? That is quite simple. People are the assets of a country. People are the assets of a country. So, here it is noun. People can be verb. The place was peopled. The place was peopled with the members of the tribes from the hills. I hope you can read the sentence. The place was peopled with the member with the members of the tribes from the hills. The place was peopled with the members of the tribes from the hills. So, let us say a place has been built and we populate the place with members of the tribes from the hills. So, here people means populated. Okay. People means populated. So, thus people can be both noun and verb. Uh, Let us see the other words in this sentence. Jump can be both noun and verb. Okay. This is relatively easier. The fact that jump is verb is well known. I jump over the fence. So, here this is a verb. This was a good jump. Here it is a noun. Okay. So, the such sentences are quite common. We can take the word high finally. High can be noun, verb and adjective. I believe the verb part of speech tag is very rare. We leave out verb, but high can be noun and adjective, which is uh, quite common. So, for example, high hills. So, here this is an adjective, and after the win, he was on a high. Here this is noun. So, after the win, he was on a high. This is noun. So, thus we find that uh, words have multiple parts of speech and it is quite common to have words in a sentence with multiple parts of speech and it is necessary to disambiguate them. Okay. So, we proceed further and uh, now suppose we have the task of part of speech tagging in front of us. We would like to pause tag these words in the sentence, people jump high. Now, a very useful convention is to have the sentence beginner, which is typically the hat symbol and the sentence finisher or sentence ender, which is the dot symbol. This is the full stop. So, these two delimiters 
are the sentinels for the sentence. The part of speech tagging begins from the hat ends on dot for a particular sentence. So, this shows here a very simple picture. We place the tags alongside or on top of every word in the sentence. So, people we saw could be noun and verb just for a simple scheme, just for discussing a simple scheme, we place all the tags on all the words. So, this is a simple minded scheme, but uh, it, it will work because the tags which are completely improbable will not be taken up. How one could place tags which are applicable is a separate discussion which we can go into later. So, we have these three words people jump high. On people we have n, v, a and r which are noun, verb, adjective and adverb tags. So, all the words have these four tags. So, assume in our discussion we are concerned only with four tags noun, verb, adjective and adverb. So, we start with uh, the hat symbol which uh, is the beginner of the sentence. From here we can transit to n or v or a or r. From here we can transit to any of these four tags and this transition is from each state. Okay. So, each tag is a state here. So, from d state four transitions are possible from v state four again a again 4, r again 4. So, there would be 16 arcs going from these state, these set of states, this first column of states to the second column of states. Similarly, from the second column to the third column, we can have 16 transitions because from each state we can make 4 transitions. And finally, we have these 4 transitions going into the finishing state which is dot. Okay. So, the uh, an important point here to note is that the sentence beginner has this trivial tag of hat and the sentence ender or the full stop has this trivial tag of dot. Okay. So, this whole uh, graph which is nothing but a graph is to be traversed for the best possible path from hat to dot. So, now let us discuss a, an important point. What we have done so far is that we have taken the words of a sentence and we have erected columns of past tags on them. Okay. It is a, a separate matter of discussion as to how we can selectively place only those tags which are applicable. This is not very important right now for uh, understanding what is going on as a process. It is uh, sufficient for us to see that on top of words, we have tag sequences, the columns of tags and each tag should be looked upon as a state. The first starting state is the hat state which begins the pause tagging process and the last finishing state is the dot state which is the full stop and uh, this finishes the tagging process. On the way starting from hat to the dot symbol, we are interested in finding the best possible path from hat to dot traversing the states. From each column, we choose only one state. Okay. So, if there are n words in a sentence, there are two delimiters hat and dot. So, if there are n words, then there are states of the tags and finally, when we find the best possible tag sequence, we would have described a path of length n plus 2 in the sense that there are n plus 2 nodes in this whole path and this path gives me the best possible tag sequence. We choose one state, one single state from each column of states. Okay. So, uh, you can see now that the whole pause tagging process has been reduced to a graph traversal task starting from the hat state to the goal state. We find the best possible path. Okay and this path chooses only one state from uh, the column of states on each word. Okay. So, this may, makes the formulation quite clear. We are now ready to 
look at the techniques of pause tagging. Before that, we would like to understand why pause tagging could be challenging and we will be discussing mainly with English examples, but in this part, let us take some examples from Indian languages and uh, this would show why part of speech tagging is a real challenge, it is not a trivial task. At this point, let me just remind you once again this fact, okay. we, uh, we spend just 2 minutes to repeat a point. Part of speech tagging is crucial for any NLP task, you have to begin natural language processing of text with part of speech tagging. So, emphasis is on the word begin, we start natural language processing with part of speech tagging. Okay. So, before part of speech tagging, what is available possibly is morphological analysis information. So, if a language has morphology analyzer, it would take the words of the language and uh, strip off the suffix, get the morphological features of the words. For example, the word lurke, here the suffix is a, the root word is lurka, the uh, number is plural form. So, this is the plural form of lurka, it could also be the oblique form. Okay. So, let us not go into those details. The point is that the words have been processed for separating the suffix from the root word and the word features are available. So, when you begin part of speech tagging, the only information that is available is the information at the word level, morphological features and the suffixes. So, we cannot assume any syntactic information is available, we also cannot assume that semantic roles are available, though the semantic properties of the words may be available, but that may require sense disambiguation. Okay. It may require words and disambiguation, but words and disambiguation is a later task which has to be done after part of speech tagging. Therefore, it is necessarily the case that part of speech tagging has to be done with tremendous amount of constraint. You can place part of speech tag on a word only from limited amount of context in the vicinity of the word. Okay. So, the word itself and maybe some two or three words before and after it, that is all. This is the only information available and using that you are forced to do the disambiguation. Okay. So, these produces challenges and let us look at some of these challenges which are very interesting. We take up the phenomenon of jo, wo, kon and their inflected forms in Hindi and their equivalents in uh, multiple languages. We will mainly discuss Hindi then some example from uh, Bengali and Sanskrit. So, the problem is to place tags on jo, wo and con on the text and their forms. Now, typically the label that is given are dem and pron. Okay, let us understand what we mean by this. Dem means demonstrative and pron means pronoun. Okay. So, pron is pronoun, dem is demonstrative. Let us look at this sentence. Jo larka kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. This is the sentence. Jo larka kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. The boy who came yesterday plays cricket well. This is the meaning of the sentence in English. Look at the word jo here, which is in capital, and it has been given the tag of dem. Okay, so jo underscore dem. Dem is the tag on Jo, which indicates demonstrative. So, here the word Jo has a demonstrative function. Jo larka kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. We uh, specify a particular boy, Jo larka. So, that is why it is demonstrative. Take the next sentence, Jo kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. So, almost same sentence, except that larka is dropped. Okay. Larka is dropped. So, uh, Jo has to find its what is called referent. What does Jo refer to? It refers to something which is not present in the sentence. However, this Jo can be matched with wo, Jo wo combination. So, Jo kal ayatha, who the person who came yesterday plays cricket well, this is the meaning. 
Now, this jo is not a demonstrative, it is a pronoun because its reference is uh, somewhere else okay. and uh, this uh, jo in linguistics has what is called demonstrative role. It uh, indicates a particular boy jo larka and this jo has an unspecified noun and, uh, the f and it is a pronoun. Okay, so, this jo is a pronoun. Now, it is uh, clear that uh, here we are faced with a disambiguation situation because jo can have both them and pron and we need to find out which uh, label will be applicable in the particular context. So, we formulate a disambiguation rule which is pretty obvious. If jo is followed by noun, then it is a demonstrative. So, you can see in the previous transparency that jo was followed by noun here okay, and therefore, it is a demonstrative. You are possibly already seeing some problems here and we will discuss those problems. So, jo is followed by noun, it is a demonstrative, else we have to take more complicated steps to find out what jo is. Now, we have the problem of what is called false negative and what is called false positive. For any rule which is supposed to produce a label or for that matter for any rule, it is possible to get into false negative and false positive situations. Let me illustrate from this example itself. When there is arbitrary amount of text between jo and the noun, then the rule that we have formulated will fail. Okay. So, take this sentence here for a moment um, forget about this okay, or ignore this uh, piece of text in capital for a moment. If you ignore this, then we have the sentence jo larka kal aya tha wo cricket achha khel leta hai. So, this jo and larka jo is clearly demonstrative. The problem is that jo will continue to be demonstrative even when it is not followed by uh, a noun because you have a, an arbitrary amount of text between jo and larka. This text is seen here. Jo bhakta hua, hafta hua, rota hua, Chennai Academy mein coaching lene wala, this should be may, Chennai Academy mein coaching lene wala larka kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. Okay. So, the sentence is a, a slightly artificial one, but an interesting sentence uh, still. Jo bhakta hua, hafta hua, rota hua, Chennai Academy mein coaching lene wala larka kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. That means, the boy who came running and who was panting, hafta hua and who was crying, rota hua and who was taking coaching in Chennai Academy. Okay. He goes to a cricket coaching class. This boy who came yesterday, he plays cricket well. So, all these are modifiers or the qualifiers for this word larka. So, jo bhaagta hua, hafta hua, rota hua Chennai Academy mein coaching lene wala larka kal aya tha, wo cricket achha khel leta hai. So, again jo is a demonstrative, but see jo is not followed by a noun, bhaagta hua, this is a verb and therefore, this rule will fail and this is a case of false negative. We are not able to place demonstrative on this jo using that rule. So, this is a case of false negative. It is saying most probably the uh, tag is not dem and is failing and therefore, this is failure is not desirable. Okay. So, this is a case of false negative and there can, can be case of false positive. For example, take this sentence here, jo duniyadari samaj kar chalta hai. Okay. Jo duniyadari samaj kar chalta hai, use tarakki milti hai. Say, this is the sentence. One who understands the ways of the world achieves success. Okay. So, in this case, if we place uh, the demonstrative tag, we will go wrong. Because jo, the rule says that if jo is followed by a noun, dunya dari is a noun here. So, it follows jo and therefore, it has placed simple mindedly a dem, the demonstrative and it has gone wrong. Okay. So, this is what we mean by false positive. 
this is wrongly given the demonstrative uh, tag. This is an interesting sentence where a demonstrative or pronoun tag cannot be decided because of ambiguity. So, the sentence is Jo Manushya Manushyo Ke Beech Rishto Nato Ko Samaj Kar Chalta Hai and then there is a piece of text. So, Jo Manushya Manushyo Ke Beech Rishto Nato Ko Samaj Kar Chalta Hai. The per, it has two meanings. One meaning is Manushya here is person, the person who understands the relationship between human beings manushyo ke beech rishto nato ko samaj kar chalta hai. So, the person who understands the relationship between human beings can be called a compassionate person ok. For example, this is a sentence. So, in this case manushya is, uh, is demonstrated by jo and therefore, this can be the uh, this can be given the label dem. But see another reading for this sentence. Jo manushya manushyo ke beech rishto nato ko samaj kar chalta hai. Here manushya manushyo ke beech means man and men, relationship between man and man. Okay. So, they go together and this jo has an unspecified noun which it refers to. Okay. So, this jo therefore, will be pronoun for that reading. Now, this is a very difficult problem at the level of pause tagging you cannot resolve this issue, because it requires grouping together manushya manushya ke beech or leaving out that grouping this manushya is separate from manushya. Okay. So, this shows a case of false positive where jo can be uh, wrongly given the tag dem and in this case it is difficult to decide it can go either way. So, therefore, a simple rule like this where jo followed by noun should be given the dem tag is very brittle it can have both false negative and false positive. We take the case of Bengali where uh, morphology markings are quite weak on the words and uh, we find here interesting cases. The sentence here is je bhalo basha pai shei bhalo basha dite pare. So, that means, one who gets love can give love. So, in this case uh, again the rule that if jo j equivalent in Bengali is j is followed by noun then it should be given the dem tag this goes wrong. Here bhalo basha is a noun it is after j, but it will go wrong because this j is not uh, referring to bhalabasha here. Okay. This j is referring to an unspecified noun not in the sentence. So, this is wrong and in this case however, the rule is uh, working right and here we have the sentence as j bhalabasha tumi kalpana korcho ta e jagate shambhav noy. The love that you imagine exists, okay. this needs a bit of correction. The love that you imagine exists is impossible in this world. J bhalabasha tumi kalpana korcho ta e jagate shambhav noy. Here this J is the demonstrative for bhalabasha and therefore, if we give the tag dem it is right. Okay. So, we have uh, a very interesting situation where the word J is followed by identical noun, but the further sentential context shows where dem would be wrong and where it will be right. Okay. So, this shows it is a difficult problem. Let us have a bit of discussion on this now. So, what is happening is that these words like jo j they have both demonstrative role and pronoun role. And uh, this clue for whether it is a demonstrative or pronoun can come from far apart in the sentence. Okay. So, the clue can be far away or the clue can be because of some kind of syntactic structure. Okay. The sentence that we had in Bengali j bhalo basha pai. Okay. So, in this case the fact that 
j is not a demonstrative for bhalo basha comes from the word pi j pi one who gets okay so this is a little far away from j and it can be quite far away depending on arbitrary amount of text being inserted and therefore uh, this disambiguation would be difficult so we proceed further we see that other forms of jo like jis jin wo us un they can fail in similar situation and all these forms are very very frequent in the corpus therefore all these put together can lead to a large amount of error of pause tagging all these errors can accumulate and you could have a situation where the accuracy is pretty low because uh, simple rules cannot disambiguate this situation we take another disambiguation rule rule number 2 which says that if jo is oblique it is attached with ne ko se etc if jo is oblique then it is pronoun okay so this also looks like an accurate rule if we do not examine this closely we might get an impression that this is all there is in giving the pronoun tag to jo okay so let's uh, repeat this rule once again if jo is oblique that means it is associated with some case marker ne ko etc then it is pronoun else there are other tests okay so this uh, will fail this will have false positive in case of languages that demand agreement between the jo form and the noun it qualifies for example in sanskrit yashya yashya balakasya anunam drashta jis ladke ka muh dekhkar okay so this is the meaning of this sentence now sanskrit uh, insists that the demonstrative and uh, the noun it is demonstrative for must have forms that agree so here it is shasti vibhakti on balakasya of the boy so shasti vibhakti has to be on the jo formus also okay yes yeah but in this case uh, this rule that if the jo form is in case marked form then it is necessarily pronoun that rule will fail now the example is with sanskrit however it can very well hold for languages which insist on this kind of agreement we have another case here yasya common yasya balakasya ananam drushtva okay so here common yasya which means uh, beautiful which is a qualifier for balak uh, indicates that between yasya and balakasya there can be arbitrary amount of text leading to the rule application going wrong okay so this indicates the complexity of formulating a rule now maybe a clarification is required here as to what uh, we mean by this oblique form and why is it the case that it will definitely get the pronoun tag let us take an example this is the example i'll take so you take the sentence jisne khana khaya wo sone chale jaye okay jisne khana khaya wo sone chale jaye so one who has eaten should prepare for bed so one who has eaten should go to sleep okay jisne khana khaya wo sone chale jaye so this is what we mean by the oblique form jisne is the oblique form of jo this is jo plus ne now in hindi the oblique form of jo will always be a pronoun form okay so that's why that rule is quite safe in hindi it is 100% accurate jisne khana khaya wo sone chale jaye here this will be a pronoun okay but we are saying that when uh, 
there are languages which insist on the ne coming on the jo form when it is demonstrative for a noun okay which insist on agreement between the jo form and the noun it is demonstrative for okay in such cases this rule will go wrong and we have seen an example in sanskrit where this kind of situation holds and other languages also may have this kind of agreement demand now elaborating further on this rule rules that depend on whether the noun following jo work on or its form is oblique or not can also fail because the case marker can be far from the noun so we can have constructs like wo or its form ladki ji se piliya ki bimari ho gayi thi so the girl who was afflicted with jaundice the girl who had jaundice is the meaning of this part of the sentence wo ladki ji se piliya ki bimari ho gayi thi ko you know this kind of construction is common in hindi these days so the case marker is quite far from wo and uh, that's why uh, we need to be careful here so we need to discuss phenomena across languages to see what kind of fail safe rules can be used for the demonstrative pronoun disambiguation okay and it is not a simple problem one has to take many language evidences so the conclusion from this discussion on dem and pronoun is that dem versus pronoun cannot be disambiguated in general at the level of past agar that is we cannot assume parsing we cannot assume semantics and if such clues are not present such information is not present then the demonstrative versus pronoun cannot be disambiguated in general so that is the conclusion from this discussion on dem and pronoun now one should not assume that this is the only difficult case for part of speech tagging there are many other such levels which uh, frequently get confused with each other one of them is main verb and auxiliary verb for uh, indian languages uh, it is also possible to confuse between noun and adjective so if we have a an expression like golf club okay or cricket bat here both cricket and bat are noun but the first cricket is having an adjective function it is an adjective which bat or what kind of bat cricket bat so here there is a confusion between noun and adjective in the next class we'll discuss the mathematics of part of speech tagging and the algorithm